What's going on, guys? Welcome to episode 538 here today of Hashtag Ask GSM for Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. I believe the first day of spring. Hope you guys are doing well and having a great week so far. A couple weeks out from WrestleMania, a lot of questions to get into, no time to waste. If you want to send in a question to the show, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRant with the hashtag Ask GSM. Find me on Facebook.com backslash Graham.GSM.Matthews. Drop a comment on the post that I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not in the wall itself. Last but certainly not least, drop your question down below in the comment section in this very video. I'll include your question in next week's edition. Uh, we'll start with Mike. It does it from YouTube. The first question was completely non-wrestling related, but I thought he, I guess he felt the need to ask this anyway. Will you be trying the KFC Cheesa? It's a KFC chicken pizza. Um, the answer is no. Now listen, I used to really, and I still do from time to time, Still like buffalo chicken pizza. My favorite go-to pizzas are just regular cheese and uh, sausage. I was a big buffalo chicken pizza guy for a long time, and I still like it on occasion. Haven't gotten it probably in a few years. The problem is, is that it has to be from the right place. Some places just plop a fucking chicken on there. Not the literal chicken, but like, it's just gross and not well made and it's too hot or too, you know, just not well made. So I'm kind of selective with where I get buffalo chicken pizza now. I know that you're not saying it's a buffalo chicken pizza, but it's the same kind of premise as far as it being a pizza, chicken pizza, buffalo chicken, whatever. The one thing that doesn't really sell me on the chicken pizza here is the KFC part. Now, I know it's not a KFC pizza, but the pizza is coming from KFC. So I don't think pizza when I think KFC. I don't eat really KFC anyway, actually. I've probably had KFC maybe twice in my life, maybe. Definitely once, maybe a second or third time, but definitely I had it once like 20 fucking years ago. So the answer is no, I will not be trying it. That doesn't sound overly appealing to me. If it was from anywhere else, then possibly. Um, But because it's coming from KFC, and I know KFC does chicken, that's why they're doing it. Um, I would not try pizza from KFC. I'm sure it's decent, but I know for a fact that would definitely not agree with my stomach, if nothing else. Your second question, is the Spirit Squad WWE Hall of Fame worthy, and if so... Do you ever think we will see them get inducted into the Hall of Fame? Absolutely not. Uh, same answer as the first question. No, um, <laughs> they're not. They're not Hall of Fame worthy. They will not get inducted. Um, they were only around for a couple of months. I know there's people that have been in the WWE Hall of Fame that never had a run in WWE or a brief run in WWE, but those people were legends, likely elsewhere. The Spirit Squad are not legends. We will see Dolph Ziggler in the WWE Hall of Fame someday down the road. No doubt about that. No one else from that group is Hall of Fame worthy. The group itself is not Hall of Fame worthy, so absolutely not. Your third question, with the debut debut of Mercedes Monet in AEW, and AEW having some of the best women's wrestlers in the world, how likely is it that AEW will do an all-women's pay-per-view with the headliner match being CEO versus DMD, that being Britt Baker? Um, Not very likely. I feel like if we haven't gotten one yet, and Mercedes Monet coming in is great, and I don't know if she's definitely not a game changer for the company. Can she be a game changer for the division? She could be. The question is whether Tony Khan will be willing to showcase the division in that way and feature the women more prominently by putting them in more main events and more main events that make sense and not just putting them in the main event for the sake of putting them in the main event, which we've seen a lot in Dynamite's history. A handful of women's main events on Dynamite, not a lot of those matches made sense to go on last. They just did it to do it. So Mercedes Monet coming in, could be a game changer in that way. Could she be a game changer in getting an all women's pay per view? Yeah, possibly. I could see that being one of the things that she wants to do, and Tony Khan relenting per usual, and just being like, yeah, yeah, sure, we'll do like an all women's pay per view, whatever you want to do, because you're the big star here or whatever. So I could see them doing it. Um, I don't think it will happen, though. They do have enough talent to create a compelling women's pay per view. The problem is that. I mean, with AEW, they would probably just put on great matches and not take the time to build actual stories. Now, the build for Evolution five, six years ago was terrible, and that ended up being a really good show. So they don't need five or six amazing stories going into an all-women's pay-per-view, but it would help. I mean, they have the roster for it. They certainly have the TV time to build it up. So I, I don't see that happening. I think Tony Khan likes the idea of having nine pay-per-views with the current format of having a majority of men's matches, one or two women's matches, and really having that be it. I mean, with with nine pay-per-views annually now, which we'll get into a little bit later on, that's what he said a few months ago. He was like, oh yeah, we're aiming to do nine pay-per-views a year compared to like the original four or five when they added Forbidden Door. Now it's like nine. They definitely could afford to take one of those shows and try out an all-women's pay-per-view. It would be nice. Do I see them doing it? No. 
Is it possible? Yes. Would it work? I think so. Would the buy rate be amazing? Probably not. But it is something worth experimenting with because I know WWE did it one time. AEW doing it would be cool as well. I just don't expect it. Bill Meister 88 from YouTube, their first question was, would the best decision for the Rock and Roman, or for Rock and Roman to win on night one, and then really stack the odds against Cody with the Bloodline Rules match on night two? Personally, I do. Um, I think it adds something to the match, and the story could lead to Rock and Roman disagreeing in the match on night two. If Cody and Seth win, then Rock can't really be on night two. That makes sense. I don't want to hear the Rock pull something like, oh, he's the boss, he can do what he wants. It would suck. Also, is there any way that Roman retains? It would be hideous, but WWE does like pulling out surprises at WrestleMania. Um, I think the Bloodline should win on night one. Like you said, to really stack the odds against Cody and not really Seth. I mean, it doesn't really matter to Seth at all on night two. He has his own match with uh, Drew McIntyre. But, you know, if they really want to make that match on night two as suspenseful as possible, would I prefer a clean, straight match with no interference? Yes, But I would be okay with it in this case. Of all the Roman Reigns matches, I would be okay with interference in this match only because they're they're playing off the spots from last year. With Jimmy getting involved, Solo Sokoa and the dumbass Cody getting involved, hitting this moment by Cody, hopefully kicking out this time. Maybe interference from other people. The bloodline is wronged over the years. I feel like that would make sense. No, I feel like the night two match has got to be... Bloodline rules. I mean, I don't love the idea of all this interference, but it would just make sense with the story they've told up to this point. Night one gives the heels he Rock and Roman go over. Um, as long as Roman is not winning on night two, your second part of your question, could Roman retain? He could absolutely retain. Do you see all the people online that are like, oh, he's got to beat Hogan's record. Who gives a fuck about Hulk Hogan's record? Certainly not me. There is no record. He's not number one. Roman would simply be moving from number four to number three on the list. For not even the same championship, but if we're talking overall world title, reigns, cool, whatever. He's not even number one. He will never be number one. He would have to hold the championship for the next four or five years. That is not happening. It's not happening. So, and and I don't think it will. So I, I really would just have Roman lose it at WrestleMania. He should have lost it last year. The extra year really didn't accomplish anything. It had him surpass a few more records. Great. Now was the time for him to drop that championship. And if he wins on night one, I wouldn't even have Seth take the pin. I would have Cody take the pin. He already lost the Drew on Raw, so it's not like he's unbeaten or whatever. Have him take the pinfall from Rock, I would say. Or maybe Roman, but if Rock pins Cody and Cody wins the championship on night two and Rock stays heel, then you have a Cody-Rock match for at some point down the road. Maybe even SummerSlam or another point within the next year. I mean, that's that's something worth revisiting one-on-one, I think. And then Roman can come back, and that kind of factors into the whole um, who's the head of the table with Rock and Roman, whatever. So, yeah, I would have the Bloodline win on night two, but Cody win on night one. Or, I'm sorry, have the Bloodline win on night one, excuse me, not the other way around. And then Cody win on night two. Roman winning on night two is just so incredibly fucking damaging. Cody already losing a night two last year was bad enough. He cannot lose again. He would look like the ultimate loser to be built up twice, win the Royal Rumble twice, and then lose both times. No chance. That would just be stupid. So, it's definitely possible. There is a very good chance Roman could retain because they're obsessed with the history-making bullshit. He's made enough history, it's time to move on. Your second question. I'm writing this before any announcements are made, so apologies apologies that this has been decided. But how would you book the first and last matches of each night at WrestleMania this year? Clearly, we know what night's two main event will be in Cody versus Roman. For me personally, I would have Seth and Cody versus Roman and Rock as the first match in night one, and Bailey versus Io Sky as the final match. Night two, Seth and Drew match, uh, on, as, as being match one, you said. I don't think it's right, but I feel the tag match will main event night one, but surely give someone else the moment rather than have Roman and Cody give them both main events but feel they won't do that due to The Rock being involved. What are your thoughts? No, they're definitely headlining night one with a tag team match. I don't think there's any debate at this point. They have invested so much in the build to that match. That is the ultimate attraction of night one, and even night two, really. They've done a better job of building up the night one tag match than they have the night two singles match for the championship between Cody and Roman. There is almost no chance that tag match goes on anything but last. Rock is not pulling curtain jerker duty by opening the show, or going on second to last. Bailey and Io is not main eventing. I feel like that's pretty clear at this point. I know Bailey and Dakota Kai main evented SmackDown last week, and that was great. They had a good match. 
that match, I mean, honestly, the build for Bailey and Io does not feel main event worthy at all. I said that three years ago with Bianca and Sasha too. Not that the match wasn't main event worthy, because it was. They went out there and had an amazing match. The build to that match was not main event worthy. But that was different, though. Three years ago, we didn't have enough matches that were like, all right, this makes sense to go on last, and you have all these options. There's at least four or five different options for matches that can go on last at WrestleMania this year. The tag team match is going on last. They've already, you know, kind of uh, uh, subjected or subscribed to that theory, that that belief that we are getting the tag match at the end of night one. Does it suck for Bailey and Io? Does it suck for Rhea and Becky? Does it suck for um, even Seth and Drew? Yes. Yes, it does, because I would rather prefer any of those matches in that spot. I mean, Seth and Drew was definitely not main eventing night one, because that match is totally night two for the World Heavyweight Championship. We know that. We know that. But they've just put so much of their stock in the build of that tag team match. There's no way that it goes on anything but last on night one. So it is what it is. I hear you about other people deserving that or belonging in that spot over the tag match. But hey, listen, Rock decided to come back. Punk got hurt. That's what happens. If it wasn't this tag match and Punk was still around, it would be Rollins and, and Punk. I would be shocked if it wasn't. I would be shocked if Rollins and Punk kicked off night two. I'd be pretty fucking pissed if I was CM Punk. I, I think they felt the need to put the Rock Tag match, do the Rock Tag match, and have it go on last, especially with Punk not being around. So, that's just what it is. Jordan B. from YouTube, he says, You mentioned that you started watching wrestling in 2008, which is also the same year I started watching wrestling. It was an episode of SmackDown that my brothers have on the TV. Um, have on the TV screen. I believe it was when Edge and The Undertaker were building through their Backlash or Judgment Day match. I remembered seeing The Undertaker rolling his eyes and sticking his tongue out, and my eight-year-old self couldn't believe what I saw. That moment made me get into wrestling. You probably answered this question before, but what was the match, moment, or wrestler that made you hook into wrestling in the first place? Sorry for the long question. I mean, no worries. There's a lot of questions that we're talking here today that are a lot longer than yours, so don't worry about the length of your question. Um, yeah, I've talked about this before, but it's really funny that you say that because I've mentioned the Regal stuff, which I'll get into in a moment and I'll keep it brief because I've told the story a million times, I'm sure on this platform and other places that other people are already aware of, but what you're talking about with edge and taker going into backlash for judgment day, that was actually what got me into SmackDown. I started watching raw first and it wasn't for another, probably about a month or so that I started watching SmackDown. I started watching Raw in April of 08. Um, it was the Regal Orton match on Raw. Now, the match itself is not a barn burner. If you go back and watch it on Peacock, Network, YouTube, whatever, it's not an amazing match. But the like the, the presentation of the match was what sold me on being a fan. At that point, I was already watching Monk, Psych, other shows on the USA Network. So I'd always wanted to watch wrestling consistently. My, my goal at that point was to watch every show on the network. I was watching Royal Pains. I thought that was a great show. Now, that, that actually came later. Uh, Burn Notice I was checking out. That was a really good show, obviously. Monk, Psych, Walker, Texas Ranger used to air on there. That was not a an original show. That was a syndicated show at that point, just airing old rerun episodes. But I wanted to check out every show on USA Network. And, you know, I tried watching the... The episode where Hornswoggle was announced as Vince's uh, illegitimate son back in um, whatever it was, you know, uh, I think September of 2007. I started, I tried to watch around then, didn't really get into it. Um, you know, I would see all the commercials for stuff. Like, I would see the commercials, all oh, for this week on Raw, and then, like, the presentation for it, but I would never actually watch the show. I checked out the anniversary show. I remember that, the ladder match between Jeff Hardy and Carlito. I remember watching that match. I tried watching bits and pieces on the road to WrestleMania. I remember seeing the commercial for WrestleMania 24 and then then realizing, oh, you have to pay for this. This is a pay-per-view. You can't just watch the show, which disappointed me. But it wasn't until I saw a commercial for a match promoting Regal and Orton as a match on Raw in England, Regal's hometown, and Regal was this wrestler that was also the evil authority figure. And I'm like, wow, this guy's fucking awesome. So, again, the match itself wasn't, wasn't really what sold me. I remember nothing else. I remember the show now because I've gone back and watched it. But I remember nothing else about going back and, you know, or, or at the time watching that show and remember any, any other match on that show really standing out. But it was the very next week. And if it was only that one match or 
commercial, because I knew at that point I had to watch the show. Because I saw the commercial, and it was during April break from school, so I was off from school and had a chance to watch the show live. It was on at 9. Typically, I was in bed around that point. But I watched the show live, loved what I saw from the Regal stuff. And if it was only just that, I probably would not have continued watching. But I tuned in the next week to see what else Regal was going to do. He ended up winning King of the Ring. And the way he did it in the most vile way possible by beating Hornswoggle, inserting himself in the first place, and then winning the whole thing was just fucking awesome. And that was really what got me into wrestling, and uh, and I've been a fan ever since. But going back to the SmackDown stuff real quick, I didn't start watching ECW until about a month later. SmackDown as well. SmackDown and then ECW. I, I don't think I knew they existed, but uh, they weren't on the same network and shit like that. But what got me into SmackDown was the Edge and Taker feud. It's, it's great that you mentioned that. It, it's probably not the exact same segment. But that was literally what also got me into SmackDown around that point. And I remember specifically seeing what really hooked me was this commercial or a video package of Taker using the go-go plot of the Hell's Gate on Edge and then him like bleeding from the mouth. This was right before they went PG. And then Vicky Guerrero, who was the GM at the time, banning the move... You know, saying he couldn't use it anymore. This was probably right after Judgment Day. So I remember seeing that and thinking, wow, like this Taker guy's sick. So, um, yeah, that was really what got me into wrestling around that point was the Edge and Taker feud on SmackDown. So you're right, right around Backlash or Judgment Day, that was also what got me into wrestling as well on the SmackDown side of things. So we can relate in that way. Brandon A. from YouTube, your question was, he says, what's up, GSM? As usual, hope all is well. He says, Rank, how much you enjoy these things that are associated with the good parts of pro wrestling? One, an excellent wrestling match that you were hyped about going in and then it delivered. Two, a pop that blows the roof off the place. Three, a nuclear nuclear heat booking reaction. That's a mouthful. Um, The right type of heat, not the go-away heat, he says. Four, a fantastic promo. Five, an epic entrance. Six, an excellent match that completely surprised you or over-delivered. So if I had to rank those, that's a good question. And I don't typically like like ranking things and like, oh, think of the top five best moments that shocked you as a fan. Like, I have no fucking clue. But where you give me options like this, I can probably do it. So if I had to rank these from one to six, from like how much I enjoy them to how much I don't really care too much about them. And I enjoy and appreciate all these things, but prioritizing them. Number one would probably be the pop that blew, that blows the roof off the place. Pops are probably my, that returns, debuts are my favorite part of pro wrestling. And for a lot of people it is, but that's what you go back and watch. A lot of the time on YouTube, sometimes if you don't have, you know, the time to watch a match or a promo or even a video package, you go back and watch the pops, the returns, the debuts, stuff like that. That really lends itself to an amazing crowd reaction. So that to me will always be number one. Two, hmm. Two and three can be interchangeable, and Epic Entrance is actually pretty high up there. That's why I've always been a WWE guy. I love AEW and other companies, but, like, the entrances mean a lot. Like, the music and the presentation of it, and WWE does it better than anyone. So, probably two. I would say two would be an Epic Entrance. Three, an excellent wrestling match that I was hyped about going in, and then it delivered, because I'm looking forward to a match, and then the fact it lives up to my expectations, if not exceeds it, is a great feeling. So that would be three. Four, um, a fantastic promo, probably. Five, I would say, um, nuclear heat, booing reaction. I think I said booking reaction earlier. Booing reaction, because that stuff's always go back to, that, that's always fun to go back and watch. And then six would be an excellent match that completely surprised me or un, or over-delivered. And that happens a lot. I love those sort of type of matches. I love being wrong and being thinking, you know, that match is going to suck. And the match ends up being amazing. That's a great part of pro wrestling because you never really know what you're going to get. And uh, But that would probably be six. So I would put that at six. Five would be the nuclear heat booing reaction. Those are always fun, especially to be a part of. Four would probably be um, a fantastic promo. I said that earlier. Three, an excellent wrestling match that I was hyped about going in and then it delivered. Two, an epic entrance. And one, a pop that blows the roof off the place. Your next question, WrestleMania is known for being steeped in tradition. Over the years, I've noticed that these have been WrestleMania traditions at one time. Some still exist, some don't. Um, And he listed the following traditions. Opening with America the Beautiful instead of the National Anthem. The WrestleMania main event being set aside for a Royal Rumble winner versus a world champion. The Undertaker's streak. 
The Finks announced her streak until that evil heel Greg Hamilton broke at LOL. The Money in the Bank ladder match, the Hall of Fame inductees being honored on stage, the WrestleMania font using Roman numerals, um, the WrestleMania posters having showcasing multiple superstars or matches instead of just one, every show since 23 being in a stadium, and um, the one time of the year where you can guarantee a unique stage design. What are WrestleMania traditions that you think I've missed? And, and in general, how important do you think these traditions are? Are the small ones still significant, necessary, or holding a small place in your heart? A, a good question. I mean, some of these don't really bother me that they do them or don't do them anymore. Um, the opening with the America the Beautiful is nice. That's not something... I think they did that every year. When I first started watching, they did it every year for a while. I feel like there was one or two years where they either didn't do it or just stopped doing it. I don't know if they still do. I think they do. I mean, it's great that they do that. Um, is it something I really long for at this point? Not really. I haven't really taken notice of that in recent years. The main event being set aside for a Rumble winner. I mean, that has just not been the case for a lot of the time I've been watching pro wrestling. I mean, maybe before 08, but... That's not really something from... I just gave up giving a shit about that because especially when we've had two world champions, even when we've had two world champions, a lot of the time the world title has not gone on last. <laughs> I mean, that's just what it is. In 08 when I was watching, Edge and Taker went on last and um, he was not the Royal Rumble winner was Taker. 09, Triple H and Orton was the Rumble winner but the match sucked. 2010 was not a Rumble winner. 2011 was not a Rumble winner. 2012 was not a Rumble winner. 2013 was, but the match sucked between Rock and Cena. 2014 through 2016... Yeah, 2014, 15, and 16 were, because we had one world championship at the time. 2017, we had two world titles. Neither of those titles main evented. The Rumble winner did not main event. It was that terrible Taker-Roman match. 2018 wasn't the Rumble winner. 2019 was the Rumble winner for the women. 2020, only one of the Rumble winners main event, that being Drew. 2021, both did, which was cool. That was the only time, I think, is 2021, um, no, 2022 at WrestleMania 38. Brock and Roman, main, I mean, I guess, I guess, although, yeah, well, I mean, I guess Ronda won the Rumble. She didn't headline, but uh, Brock won the Rumble, which was terrible, and they headlined night two. And then last year, uh, the tag title match main event in night one. None of those guys won the Rumble. And then, or, or women, whatever. And then night two, Cody did. So that that really hasn't mattered to me because WWE themselves hasn't stuck to it. You would think with two nights of Mania, that would automatically you know, guarantee the women main eventing night one, the men main eventing night two. But it just hasn't worked out that way for the last couple of years. So that doesn't really bother me. The Taker streak hasn't been a thing for a while. But when that was around, I mean, the time that I was watching, it was a great annual tradition. So... That one I agree with. The Fink announcer streak, I agree with. Again, that wasn't really something I noticed in the time that he was around that I was watching. But it was cool that he was doing it for the first, like, 30-something years. Um, the Mania font using Roman numerals really never dawned on me. I mean, I just call it WrestleMania 13. I never really use the Roman numerals when writing about it, talking about it. So, that doesn't really do much for me. The Mania poster, I don't really give a shit about. Um, every show being 23, since 23, being in a stadium... Don't give a shit about it. If they were to say tomorrow, hey, next year's Mania will not be in a stadium, it's going to be in MSG, I wouldn't give a fuck if they broke that tradition. Um, there was another tradition for a few years where they had Roman main event like three or four consecutive Manias and the matches sucked. Um, <laughs> 32, 33, 34. Any main event to 31 too. So the Roman main event was a very real thing from 2015 to 2018. It's like, dude, what are, what are we doing here, you know? But anyway, um, that was one, I guess, uh, jokingly one tradition I think of. I mentioned, I forgot to mention the Money in the Bank ladder match just now. Um, yeah, that was that was a cool tradition, but they only did it for five or six years. Like, we've had 40 manias, and they only did it for five or six years, which is still a tradition. I mean, I guess now the Andre the Giant Memorial Battle Royal is a tradition of WrestleMania. It's not a mania itself, it's Mania Weekend. Who gives a shit, though, obviously? Um, they used to close, not really a formal tradition, but it felt like every, almost every single Mania for the first like 30 years had a happy ending, aside from maybe like two. And if it wasn't a happy ending storyline wise, it was the people, it was the guy that people wanted to win. It was like the feel good ending. In the last 10 years, we haven't had a lot of feel good endings. Roman has won the last couple of years, so that's not a feel good ending. 
uh, from a storyline standpoint, or even last year, it's like, dude, is he really fucking winning again? What the fuck? You know, stuff like that. So, I mean, that was that was a tradition, too. I mean, Vince has kind of backed that up in saying to other people about, like, the Nexus thing at SummerSlam 2010. Oh, we need to send the crowd home happy. Well, no, you don't. If the other person winning makes more sense, then you do that. And thankfully, that's what they've done for the past 10 years. Like, Rollins winning was not a happy ending as far as storyline-wise, but for fans, it was a great fucking ending because that was what, who that was the guy that people wanted to win, and he cashed in and won. So, um, yeah, n- none of these traditions really matter that much to me. Um, just watching the show. I mean, I think... What makes Mania great isn't isn't the traditions that WWE has for it, but the traditions that the fan themselves have for the show. How you watch it, who you're watching it with, enjoying the show, memories of watching the show as a kid, or even now and spending the time with friends and family watching the show. That, to me, is really where the important traditions are rooted with WrestleMania, not Mania itself and any one thing that the WWE does as far as like, oh, they introduced the inductees for the Hall of Fame. Like, yeah, I expect it every year, but it's not something to me that makes or breaks the show. Next question uh, from Chris W. from YouTube. Their first question was, he says, Hi, Graham. Hope you're doing well and had a great St. Patrick's Day and are having a fantastic week so far. How do you feel Kyrie Sane has been booked so far since her return? While it is nice to have her back in WWE, she's been basically placed in the same position that she was in when she left the first time, and that she's just another tag team wrestler in a hollow tag team division. Do you feel she should be used more than just a tag team competitor? Overall, yes. Now, no. I mean, right now, what the fuck else would you be doing with her? There's so many women in that division on Raw, SmackDown, even waiting in the wings in NXT. They just called up Tiffany, and Roxanne Perez is probably on her way up as well. You can't do something meaningful with every single woman on their own. She's doing something. It's not like they just brought her back to do nothing. A lot of the people on the show at least have something going on, whether it's being in a faction or whatever. With Kyrie, she's in a faction that makes sense, and she wasn't just thrown in there. She has history or had a history with Bailey before they ousted her. She has history with Asuka, EO. That whole group is great. This current incarnation of damage control is great. So I'm glad she's doing that. Do I want to see do the Do I want to see her doing the Kabuki Warriors thing long term? No, because like you said, that division is so hollow. No one gives a shit. Those belts mean nothing. Once their run runs its course, beyond that, I think Asuka might be hurt right now anyway. So that might be positive news for um, Kyrie Sane if they want to push her on her own. And I don't want to see Asuka get hurt, but it could lead to opportunities where Kyrie is used more on her own. Then great. At some point, I would like to see Asuka kind of elevate Kyrie by either putting her over one-on-one or just managing her and having her be the singles focus. Kind of like what I want to see with the Street Profits right now, where Montez should be the uh, focus of the Profits one-on-one in singles competition and not just, you know, it's about the both of them in a tag team. I think that would be more beneficial to Kyrie and Montez. That's a different question, though. Um, I think her run so far has been fine. She turned heel, joined Damage Control. She's been on TV almost every single week. Um, won the tag titles back, which made sense. So, it's been fine so far. It's been perfectly fine. Their second question, was WCW overrated? As someone who saw the final five years of the promotion, I can sometimes look back in the promotion and have difficulty finding out what made the company so special. Sure, you have the NWO story, the storyline with Sting and the Raptors and the stuff with Goldberg. This company didn't really have that many interesting storylines, or if they did, they did not have half as much attention as the NWA, uh, they didn't get um, half as much attention as the NWO guys got. Once uh, 1997 ended, the company was exposed as one with no leadership and one with too many snakes in the pit. The final few years made the company become a cautionary tale that people are starting to make comparisons to AEW, which I do not agree with, um, he says. My caution, or my question is, um, through all the great times and bad times they had, was WCW overrated or are they seen through the rose-tinted glasses for only the few years that they were on top? Listen, WCW had a lot of fans. I I do not think WCW is overrated. I'm also not the best person to be asking this question because I was not growing up watching WCW. I have not gone back watched. I have not gone back and watched a lot of WCW content. But even without watching WCW, I can tell you it was not overrated. Um, you could say the same thing about ECW as well. ECW was never my cup of day. Again, growing up, I it wasn't around. I'm, I'm talking like the actual promotion, not the brand. The brand was fine, but like. The company itself, going back and watching that stuff, it's not my cup of tea. I think a lot of the stuff they were doing was terrible. But do I think it's overrated? No, because it was different, it was an alternative, and it was uh, it, it really set up different stuff that WWE was doing in the years that followed in the Attitude Era and beyond. 
And the same can be said with WCW. I mean, they borrowed a lot of their big stars in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Booker T came from WCW. Diamond Dallas Page didn't have a lot of success in WCW. I mean, in WWE, but you know they took him. They took Sting years later. Goldberg had success in WWE. He was a WCW guy, obviously. Um, the NWO they brought over, among many other things. So I mean, yeah, people only look at it sometimes from the NWO stuff and think, wow, the promotion was so great. But they were doing a lot of things differently than WWE that were just working. WCW, in a lot of ways, was the cool fucking show compared to WWE specifically in the mid-90s. And if it wasn't for WCW really lighting a fire under WWE's ass, who knows where WWE would be today or at that time or whatever. Would they have gone out of business? Who knows? No one had ever really taken it to WWE and Vince McMahon the way that Ted Turner and WCW did in the 90s. And that alone does not make WCW. I mean, that, that alone ensures that WCW is not overrated. I mean, the company's existence alone benefited WWE long-term, used a lot of their talent, adopted different ideas. The cruiserweight division, WCW idea. I mean, you could say Mexico and Lucha Libre and stuff, but on a national U.S. scale, WCW did it first, and ECW before WWE. Um, That sort of stuff, and the way they kind of created crash television TV kind of came from WCW first with the NWO stuff before WWE started doing it in the 97s and 98s and stuff like that, so... Um, no, I do not think WCW is overrated, and, and I think it speaks volumes that when WCW closed, those people that were diehard WCW fans did not come back. They did not try out WWE. They did not start watching WWE, and if they did, they weren't impressed with what they saw because they quickly tuned out, probably after watching the invasion and thinking, wow, this is fucking terrible, and they never watched it again. So um, WCW had its very passionate, hardcore fan base, and it was not niche either. It was a very big fan base that WWE flushed down the toilet when they bought that promotion and did nothing with that promotion. Did not keep it running, did not do justice by those three letters. They just flushed it right down the fucking toilet. And a lot of those people just stopped watching wrestling altogether and never came back. So, no. I don't think WCW is overrated. Your next question. Who are pro wrestlers that you, uh, who you would feel would be a legit athlete for mixed martial arts? I know pro wrestlers who got big off of MMA, like Ken Shamrock, Ronda Rousey, and Dan Severn, uh, due to their mainstream media exposure and others who were pro wrestlers before they, uh, before then, they became MMA guys like Brock Lesnar, Minoru Suzuki, and Katsuyori Shibata. Who do you think in any company would be legit believable in MMA? Off the top of my head, I think guys like Samoa Joe with his background in judo, BJJ, and kickboxing. Kyle O'Reilly, a purple belt in BJJ and has years of kickboxing experience. Bobby Fish, same, he says. Kurt Angle, gold medalist in wrestling. TJP, catch wrestling. Eddie Thorpe and Charlie Dempsey in NXT. And uh, while I can only think of Ariana Grace in NXT with her background in judo and BJJ, who do you pick? Um, I mean, off the top of my head, Chad Gable, I feel like, being an Olympian as well. Uh, Jeff Cobb, being an Olympian, uh, an Olympic wrestler. Uh, would benefit him very well in MMA, I think. Both Gable and, and Cobb has some more size on him than uh, than Gable does. But either one of those guys would be fucking awesome in MMA, I think. So either one of them, uh, Kurt Angle. I mean, I think those are would be my answers. You mentioned Angle; he would have been another one that came to my mind uh, in his prime, not like not even like ten years ago. We're talking like early two thousands, Kurt Angle, or like even. Before his issues with drugs and alcohol in the mid-2000s, he would have been perfect for MMA. Like, when Brock went over, Angle following Brock to MMA would have been fucking awesome. Um, But it didn't happen, and his body was too beat up by that point anyway. He already broke his neck, so probably not. He already broke his neck in the Olympics. So, anyway. Um, Yeah, those would be some people, and you named everyone that I would probably mention anyway. So, those are some good names that would, I think, fare well in the MMA world. Your last question here. Last week, I talked about how unfair it was that Chad Gable had to be pushed aside for Sami Zayn to be the opponent for Gunther at WrestleMania. A lot of the time, former black and gold stars are booked more than the modern NXT alumnus. Uh, Or do you feel Triple H mostly books his favorites from NXT black and gold more often than others, and you think it is a detriment or a creative misfire? I mean, that's just blatantly not true. I mean, you you could say that he books people from that black and gold period more favorably, or better than some of the recent NXT people, I just feel like that's just not true. It's just not, because, you know, Braun Breaker's here now, he has a high ceiling for success, Tiffany, 
Uh, other people that were called up in the past year, Solo Sokoa was not a black and gold NXT guy. I mean, he was a Bloodline guy, so that makes sense why he would be booked so well. Among other people, um, you know, they've done well in spite of not being black and gold superstars. But Gunther was not, I mean, Gunther came from NXT UK. He was not black and gold NXT, though. That was the Shawn Michaels guy. He was also on NXT 2.0 for a while. But what you're talking about specifically with like Sami Zayn and Chad Gable and people like that, I mean, Shayna Baszler is a prime example of someone who is an NXT black and gold girl, so to speak. And Triple H has done fucking nothing with her. I know she beat Ronda Rousey at SummerSlam, but where was the follow-up? There was none. He did nothing with her. She was, she's been an afterthought ever since. So that's just not true. And as far as Sammy and Gable, I mean, I guess you can make that argument. I could see that for certain cases. But, like, DIY are not tag team champions right now. They've been on the show a fair amount lately, but that's because they should be. With Gable and Sammy specifically, that logic is just comical because Gable came up at the same fucking time as Sami Zayn. Gable was in NXT at the same time that Sami Zayn was there. Gable joined NXT in 2014. He and Jason Jordan became Alpha Academy in 2015. They were tag team champions in 2016. He got called up in 2016. Sami Zayn was called up in 2016. So it's not like he had Sami Zayn win because, oh man, I'm so favorable towards Sami Zayn. Chad Gable was also in NXT gold as well, black and gold as well. They came from the exact same fucking era of NXT. So that's just not true. Um, I, I don't even know what other, what other examples you could use because for everyone like, I don't know, like Roman wasn't an NXT black and gold guy. He was in NXT for a fucking month before they called him up. He has been way more of a main roster guy than he was ever on NXT. And it's not like Triple H took the belt off of him as soon as he took over. It's not like Triple H said, hey, let's take the belt off of Roman because he's not one of my guys. No, he's had the belt on him ever since. You know, and, and Rollins, he's been the World Heavyweight Champion. But again, I would, he's not even an NXT black and gold guy to me. He wasn't even in NXT for very long. He's a Triple H guy, but he wasn't in NXT for very long. Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn are Triple H guys, but Owens hasn't really been doing a whole lot lately. Cody Rhodes isn't a Triple H guy. He never spent the fucking day in NXT, and he's been the top babyface on Raw. So I think that logic is just comical. And it's not just you that said that either. I've seen other people say that, like, oh, Triple H favoring his NXT kids. I mean, really? I mean, he's favoring Dusty's kid, and Dusty was in NXT. But beyond that, I mean, Cody Rhodes never spent the fucking day in that company or in the NXT black and gold era. So why would... This doesn't make sense to me. That doesn't make sense. And it's, I'm not saying he treats everyone equally, and there's other people that he could be using better. But the logic and the idea that he only pushes people that he spent time with in NXT five, ten years ago is just not true. Um, Christopher L. from Facebook, his first question was, We all know the awesomeness of Gunther and his reign as the Intercontinental Champion. He is the greatest in a long line of amazing title runs in this category. But who do you think is the worst title reign or has the worst title reign in the history of WWE? I mean, that's such a broad fucking question. I don't know if you're talking to t like any title, period, because I have no idea. I mean, there's been a million title reigns in this company. Um, I don't know if you're talking world championship. I don't know if you're talking specifically the intercontinental championship. I don't know about ever, because people have held the championship for like 45 seconds. Andrade held the champ. Andrade. Andre. <laughs> That's what actually Jim Ross called Andrade Andre many, many times in AW by accident. Now, Andre was WWE champion for like a minute. Jeff Hardy was world champion 15 years ago for like two minutes. Uh, there have been world title reigns that were brief due to money to make cash -ins. They were a minute. You know, that, that shit would probably, to me, be the worst title reigns ever. If you're talking like an actual run that didn't end quickly, I mean, The Miz won the money in the bank or cashed in money in the bank to become WWE champion. At Elimination Chamber 2021 lost the belt within eight days to Bobby Lashley on Raw eight days later. So it's like, what was the point, you know? Uh, Jack Swagger still comes to mind. Ginger still comes to mind. Are they the worst title reigns period in, in WWE history? No, they're not. I can't imagine they would be. But those two runs specifically in the last 15 years, Swagger's in 2010, Mahal in 2017, were fucking bad, man. I mean, those, those reigns alone tarnished, not completely, but definitely hindered the legacy of the championships they were holding. When Swagger won that World Heavyweight Championship, the world title was already on its last legs, it wasn't, like, retired for another couple of years, but that just flushed it down the toilet. It's like, whoa. And I like Swagger, too, at the time, but it's like they booked him like complete shit. Jinder should have never held the championship to begin with and the world championship to begin with, but they did, and it sucked, and that almost single-handedly killed SmackDown in 2017. The show wasn't going to go off the air, but the belt meant nothing, the main event scene sucked, the show was terrible to tune into a lot of the weeks. 
I mean, that was a dark time for the blue brain. I talked about it before. Anyway, your second question from Facebook. The last couple of weeks that dirt sheets have reported is that there's a lot of tension going on in the locker room between the roster and the rock due to his preferential treatment in his social media promos. While no doubt rock is a gigantic star, his ego seems to have caused a rift in the locker room. Do you think it could eventually worsen if it is not kept under control or do you think it's all part of a master plan? Here's the thing with the Rock promos. I saw the same thing that you did. Who gives a shit? The Rock is one of the biggest stars in the entire world. If he gets away with certain stuff that people on the current roster can't, whoop did he fucking do? I mean, it was the same thing from 10, whenever, 10 years ago when he came back, when Punk was bitching about Rock being back. I mean, yeah, he was in the main event two, three years in a row was The Rock, but he did big business for that company that benefits everyone else on the roster. Punk realizes that now. Cena realizes that now. And this is kind of the same thing. People are watching... I mean, WWE was already doing great business. Did they need The Rock? No. But The Rock is putting more eyes on the product by simply being involved. And the shit he's doing on social media is great. It would be one thing that if the promos he was cutting on social media were damaging or they sucked, it's like, all right, this is just stupid. Why are they letting him get away with this? But no, it's great TV. And he can get away with it the same way that Stone Cold can get away with a lot of stuff when he comes back. Or John Cena a lot of the time. And and Cena's a company guy. He would never really do this sort of shit anyway. But they're stars. And I know you can make the argument, well, this is why other people aren't over because they're not allowed to do this sort of thing. That's true. And there are, there is definitely a double standard. That's not even a question. There is absolutely a double standard. And I can understand the frustration from the talent. But when you're on a level of the rock, you can get away with whatever the fuck you want. It's honestly as simple as that. There's going to come a time in five, ten years when Rollins comes back as a part-timer. Roman is already a part-timer. And they're going to get away with shit like that too. Roman can already get away with a lot for being in a guy in his position that other people on the show wouldn't be able to get away with because they're not as big of a star as Roman Reigns. I get it, but it's not like, I don't know, Chad Gable ain't going on Twitter and, and cutting, dropping F-bombs anyway, so who gives a shit? The Rock, it makes sense. And if Cody, as long as he's allowed to fight back, that's kind of the biggest criticism with me. Rock's cutting these promos, burying Rollins, burying Cody. If they can fire back the way that Cody did on Monday night, then I'm okay with it. That's cool. He's not firing back the same way that Rock did, but that's not within his character to kind of do that anyway. He wouldn't go on Twitter and cut a 20 minute 20 minute promo about Rock's fucking dog or something I don't know so that's not, that's not the sort of character that Cody is so again I can see the frustration I can understand the double standard there but like you said he's a gigantic star and the rift in the locker room is talent just having too big of an ego the the, the Rock wrestlers have egos not every single one but a majority of them do that's why they're in the business and a lot of them are they just it's just instinctual and it's not doing negative business it's not having a negative effect on the company again like I said if he was coming in shifting his weight around throwing his dick all over the place not literally but (laughs) you know what I mean as far as like doing whatever the fuck he wants and it was terrible television damaging coming in burying people like just beating people then yeah that would be a bigger problem but this shit he's doing is entertaining it's working and it makes sense so who fucking cares Next question, also from Christopher. I might be in the minority here, but I have not been feeling very high in the build for WrestleMania this year. Uh, None of the matches have had the strongest or or most exciting builds, excuse me, and even the big feuds for the big matches haven't felt special. And I feel a lot of uh, that has something to do with The Rock stealing the spotlight from the roster and the shows itself. What do you think? Uh, Do you think the build for the matches have been very lackluster? No, I completely disagree. Completely disagree. Christopher, I hate to, like... I'm I'm not shitting on you, but I know there's a lot of... You ask a lot of great questions. I don't want to make it sound like I'm singling you out or I'm specifically uh, shitting on your questions exclusively today, but I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum with all the stuff you're asking today. No, I completely disagree. This road to WrestleMania to me has been the best that it's been probably in 15 years, at least. I mean, I would love to know anyone to point me in the direction of a road to WrestleMania, and it's hard to remember, I get it, that consistently had great television the way that Raw and SmackDown do right now. The Rock stuff isn't for you, that's fine. But there's a lot of other stuff they're doing right now on both brands that is working. I thought Raw on Monday was great. They're doing a good job of having good matches, but really focusing in and honing in on the promos. The character work, the storyline development, it's all great. I'm not saying every match in Mania is going to be a barn burner, but I think 
The last few Manias have been very, very good, and the build wasn't always amazing. If those Manias were good to great, and the build wasn't great, the build this year has been awesome. And I think the event itself could be as good, if not better. There's a chance the event itself could fall flat, be disappointing with such high expectations from someone like me. But I just completely disagree, because it's not like The Rock is on every Raw, for example. If you're saying SmackDown, then maybe. But, like, the damage control stuff could use a better build. I agree with that. Becky and Rhea has gradually gotten more and more, okay, I'm invested in this. The promos are great. They're doing a better job of selling me on that match that I was already excited for in the first place. That, for example, Drew and Seth have gone out there and had great promos so far. They've had a lot of really, really good promos on Raw in the last couple of weeks. Um, the tag team title stuff makes sense. Gable and Sammy makes sense. I mean, Gable, Gable, Gable and Gun- I mean, I said Gable and Sammy. Gunther and Sammy makes sense. Um, and Gunther should have been facing Gable. I get that, but you know, it, it's the way the chips fall. And we already talked about that last week. But Sammy's not a bad opponent. The United States Championship stuff. It's been solid. I don't know. I've just been loving the road to WrestleMania personally. Um, I think the shows have been great. I'm enjoying the the feuds. I like a lot of the card. The card on paper is super, super strong. Like the build for AJ Knight is pretty basic stuff. I get that. And again, you're entitled to your opinion. I'm just saying for me personally, it's been a very fun road to Mania. And it has made every show to me feel more must-see than it has been in a very, very long time. Next question of his... It's another one of your legacy questions, so here we go. Um, Your question was, what will be the legacy of AJ Styles when he retires? To me, he will go down as the sole guy who proved you can make it in WWE if you came from TNA Wrestling. He dominated in TNA, finding massive success while also finding massive success in the early years of Ring of Honor. Then, after having been banished from TNA in 2014, I mean, he left on his own, um, unless you're talking storyline-wise. He spent nearly two years basically owning New Japan Pro Wrestling and rediscovering himself as the all-time best leader of the Bullet Club. After those two fantastic years in New Japan, he finally debuts in WWE to a massive pop of the 2016 Royal Rumble, and even though he had a rough couple of months when he got his feet running, um, he found himself gold by feuding with John Cena and having tremendous matches, especially the barn burners they had at uh, SummerSlam and the Rumble, blah, 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 in 2016. While he uh, has struggled to really find something to sink his teeth into in the past two years, um, I feel when all is said and done, he will go down as one of the best stars to ever bypass NXT. What do you think his legacy will go down as? I mean, he's not only one of the best stars to ever bypass NXT, he's one of the best wrestlers that WWE has ever signed, period. I mean, you mentioned it all in your question. I mean, it's funny, you ask me these questions, but you kind of answer the question yourself in the whole legacy part of it. He will go down as one of the best wrestlers to ever succeed in WWE at a high level. I mean, he hasn't been a main event guy for quite a while now, I get that, but he's been the Intercontinental Champion, United States Champion, Tag Team Champion, WWE Champion, one of those reigns lasting for a year, beating John Cena, beating Randy Orton, facing The Undertaker in the main event of WrestleMania, facing Jericho Mania, Edge, among other people. I mean, he's had a lot of success in WWE. Some really, really good matches. Um, some really, really good feuds, has thrived as a babyface, a heel, great merchandise numbers, a perennial fan favorite. This is a guy that should have never succeeded in WWE, not because he doesn't deserve it, but because he was not the sort of guy that WWE would have pushed 15 years ago. Had he come in any earlier than he did, there's a very good chance he would not have succeeded. But Vince McMahon ended up growing fond of him. Maybe he had to prove himself first, but uh, he grew fond of him, pushed him at a high level, and it paid off big. I mean, he is a phenomenal talent, one of the all-time best of this current generation, if not of all time, and he has thrived in many different promotions. If he got sick of WWE and wanted to leave, which I don't get the feeling that he will, I thought that for a year or two, and it just seems like that's not going to happen now. But you could have gone to AEW and been a star over there, no doubt. No doubt. I mean, he was a top guy in New Japan, Ring of Honor, like you said, TNA, and now WWE. Headlining, I think he might be the only person ever to have headlined Bound for Glory, Final Battle, did he headline Wrestle Kingdom? I don't remember. But definitely WrestleMania. And that's pretty amazing. I don't think he ever headlined Wrestle Kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. But he definitely did headline um, um, all those other pay-per-views. And that's pretty amazing. So, uh, yeah, AJ is just... I, I feel like we forget how amazing he is sometimes because he has been around for so long and we kind of underrate his specialness as a talent. But he really will go down as a game-changer in the same way that Punk and Brian did in the early... 2010s for changing the way that WWE views and scouts talent. 
from Ring of Honor, from the indie scene, and really opening the doors for people like Kevin Owens and Sami Zayn and people like that. AJ did very much the same thing. I know Samoa Joe was the first to come over from TNA, but because of AJ's success and popularity, Bobby Roode had success on the main roster. Austin Aries was brought in around that same time. Uh, EC, I mean, a lot of these people ended up failing, obviously. EC3. <laughs> uh, McIntyre was brought back, though, from his time in TNA. Bobby Lashley was brought back after his time in TNA. The Hardy Boys were brought back after their time in TNA. They were always going to come back. But I'm just saying, like, for a long time, no one from TNA was coming to WWE, and AJ really opened those doors. Samoa Joe was the first, but AJ really broke open those floodgates in many ways. So there's a lot to his legacy, but that's a big part of it. No L from Facebook. Their first question was, do you see Chad Gable challenging Sami Zayn to a winner take all match? I don't, I don't know what your question meant here. Uh, before WrestleMania, only for Gunther to cost them both. And then the WrestleMania match is made into a triple threat for the Intercontinental title. Um, absolutely not. If they were going to add Chad Gable, they would have had him come out on Raw during the contract signing and say, hey, my shoulders were not down and they would have turned it into a triple threat there. They're not waiting until two weeks before Mania to add Chad Gable in a very dumb fucking fashion, too, by having him face Sammy on Raw, and then Gunther interrupts the match. We literally saw that last year between Sheamus and Drew, where Imperium interrupted the match, and then it turned into a triple threat for Mania. That would literally be taking the exact same play out of that playbook for another Gunther match at Mania. I'm almost glad that it's not a triple threat. I would rather have Gunther versus Gable or Gunther versus Sammy. I don't like the triple threat idea. Gunther deserves a singles match at Mania, and that's it. Chad, they, they missed the boat on that, but Sammy's the guy now, so you run with that. You don't change it. You don't add him. I would rather see Gunther face Gable at another time and really finish his feud with Gunther down the road. He has no beef with Sammy. I, know, I, I saw their interaction on Raw and whatever. He can cost Sammy the win at Mania. We'll talk about that in a couple minutes, but... I don't like that idea either. Um, but the beef there is with Chad and Gunther, not Chad and Sammy. If, if Chad's in the match, he has no issue with Sammy. He doesn't have any reason to be mad at him. So I'd rather see Chad and Gunther at another time down the road. Um, your second question. Do you see heel Roxanne Perez slowly but surely getting over and winning the NXT Women's Championship in the coming months? Or do you see her and Cora Jade coming up to Raw or SmackDown coming up as a duo to destroy the women's rosters? Uh, coming up together is not a bad idea, but they would probably be saddled with the tag titles. No thanks. I think Cora Jade can do her own thing. She won't be healed for a while anyway. Roxanne Perez should be on the main roster well before Cora Jade. Cora Jade will not be back for a long time. Um, Roxanne Perez should be main roster bound in the draft. I mean, she has had a great run in NXT, but it's time to call her up. And I could see her winning the NXT Women's Championship is standing to deliver. I know she's getting the shot. They announced that last night, her and Lyra. It would make sense if she won because she lost at um, the last show at Vengeance Day. She failed to win the championship. She wasn't pinned. They could put the belt on her, but again, to do what? Just to drop it back to Lyra or another babyface? Like, Roxanne Perez should be called up after Mania. There's really no reason to extend her run. They probably will. Braun Breaker spent the whole fucking year in NXT before getting called up just recently after losing the NXT championship. So, who knows, I guess, but... Um, I think with uh, Roxanne, she should be called up on the Sooner side. But if she wins the NXT Women's Championship, she's got a new lease on life as the SEAL character. That's fine, too. At Reborn Again, John Ritland from the Twitter machine and on YouTube. Real, I almost forgot what I was going to say for a second. Real Honestly with John Ritland. Check out his content. That's great work. His first question was, so based on their interactions on Raw, Chad Gable was either costing Sammy the match at WrestleMania or beating Gunther after Sammy fails to do so, right? Man, I really hope it's the latter. I fear it's the former, though. I feel like he will cost Sammy at Mania or just turn on him after Mania. I don't like that. Gable's story is with Gunther, man. It's not with Sammy. Gable should beat Gunther for the Intercontinental Championship. Not What the fuck? I mean, Sammy and Gunther is cool and all. That match would be amazing. We saw that in the gauntlet a few weeks ago. But still, I just feel like it would be a better idea to have Gable just straight up beat Gunther. And then Sammy endorses him and... All this other sort of shit. I just feel like nothing's accomplished by having Sammy get betrayed by Gable. Gable turns heel. And then after that feud's over, Gable ain't going anywhere, bro. Gable is not going anywhere up on the card. He is probably just going to fucking disappear after losing to Sammy Zayn. So I would rather it be the latter, but it probably will be the former because that's just the vibe that I get from where they're going with this. So we'll see. Um, your second question. Tony Khan recently said the company will have nine pay-per-views in 2024. That's quite a bit to expect from a fan base that's dwindling as far as TV ratings and attendance go, isn't it? 
Yeah, we've talked about AEW's pay-per-view numbers before as far as how many they could do. Nine, I think, is still too many. It's better than monthly. I mean, I get that, but... I don't know. Like, is Dynasty really in a, a necessary pay-per-view when you have double or nothing a month later? No. I mean, it's made the shows a little bit better that they're building week to week and they're not stretching out storylines for three months. I mean, that's a benefit. I don't know. Listen, if the shows deliver, then I don't really care personally. I always think less is more. I mean, WWE already still has more than, I think, nine pay-per-views a year. They've cut down and they still have more than AEW. So, I can't really completely shit on AEW when they have even more people on their roster than WWE does. But, you know, if the pay-per-views deliver, like Wrestle Dream did, an unnecessary show, but the show is great, then whatever. All Out last year, the week after All In, a very unnecessary show, but it was a great show. So, I, I mean, we talk about this a lot, but... You know, attendance is dwindling, ratings are dwindling. The pay-per-views really have no effect on the TV ratings, I don't think. Um, the pay-per-views that are, that is. The attendance, that is a factor, though, because if they're running more shows and they're bringing in less people, that's a problem. So we'll see how that plays out in the months ahead. Your last question here, non-wrestling related. Um, do you think the new Ghostbusters will get the franchise back on track after the middling effort, in my opinion, that was Afterlife? Or is Frozen Empire doomed to fail? So I will be seeing it as well, I think on Friday. I've been watching the, the last couple of movies back. I watched Ghostbusters every year on Halloween, so I didn't really feel a need to rewatch that one. But we rewatched Ghostbusters 2 on Monday. And it was actually, it was it was good, but it was not as good as I remember. Like, it was definitely an unnecessary movie. I've seen some people say recently, oh, Ghostbusters 2 is better than 1. I don't know what, fuck you're, what the fuck you're on or what you're smoking, but 1 is infinitely better than 2. It's not even close. Um... But I'll be rewatching after, I'm going to say Aftermath, After Life a little bit later on today. And I, I really like that movie. I actually thought that was a great movie. I know you called it a middling effort. Um, I thought that was the perfect close to the franchise. I really did not think there was a need for another Ghostbusters movie. I thought the way they closed it out in Afterlife was perfect. And now they're just making another movie. I'm not a big fan of that. Um, I don't know if it'll get it back. Again, I don't know if it'll be gotten back on track. Because again, I thought the last movie was great. I just didn't really think that this new movie was necessary. So we'll see it on Friday. You're going to be seeing it as well. I think you saw it. No, you didn't see it last night. Someone else on my timeline saw it last night. But, you know, I'm curious what you think of it. Um, I'll share my thoughts on Letterboxd as well this weekend. And I don't know. They'll probably make more movies after this upcoming one. I'm sure they will. I just don't really think it's necessary. Just leave well enough alone and move on. Um, at the average grunt from Twitter, his question was, when playing GM slash universe mode, do you prefer to play it as a kayfabe GM or a legit booker? For example, if you set up a number one contenders match, do you pick who you want to go over or do you let it play out and whoever wins, wins? If you watch hashtag GSM for GM here on the channel, cheap plug, it is more of the former. I don't play any of the matches. I watch some of the matches, but I typically simulate all of the matches. There's been only one or two instances where I wanted a certain person to go over to set up certain matches. And in that case, I just do the, you know, uh, fix a match option. But I don't, I don't play the match, actually. I, I do the fix the match thing. So um, I would much prefer that because, I don't know, I, I think it is more exciting. You're right. I've always done that with GM mode. I've always just simulated the results because I think it's more fun to not know where certain storylines are going, and then I just make the most of the circumstances. So if I want to do a certain feud, then I'll do a certain feud, and I'll try to make sense of it. But as far as match results go and number one contender stuff, for the most part, I do not do that on purpose. I do not legit book as far as like, all right, this person's going to win, that person's going to win, because I feel like doing it the simulation way, and I'm glad they had that option in the new GM mode as they did in the old GM mode. It's just way much more, it, it's so much more fun. Like it presents more possibilities, it's more exciting to follow, watch the matches. So yeah, I am more of a kayfabe booker than a legit booker, although there are certain times where I tweak certain things to get the results that I want, but that's not very often. Um, at noob underscore n underscore co TV, and by the way, on the 2K front, the 2K24 announcement for when we're starting GM mode in that game is in the, not the last hashtag ask GSM, I mean, or the last GSM for GM, the other hashtag show. I, I do talk about it there though, so it's coming up soon. Full announcement on hashtag GSM for GM. Check it out. Um, anyway, at noob underscore n underscore co TV from Twitter, your first question was, your thoughts on Mercedes Monet's debut on AEW Dynamite last week? I'm going to give her a chance, five or seven months, give or take. I hope that she'll change the direction of AEW's women's division going forward. I hope so, too. I mean, Mercedes is a big star. She is. There's no doubt about it. 
And I think she's a great asset to that division. The company too, but it's not like she's going to be bringing in all these new eyes to the product, to the company. And she's going to be a game changer in that respect. I don't think she will be. Okada won't be. Osprey probably won't be, at least not right away. Um, they are amazing assets to the company in other ways in, in terms of their respective divisions and what they could do long term. Mercedes, I don't think will be there long, long term, probably two to three years, but she will be back in WWE at some point. We, we know that. She said as much last week. Um, but I thought the debut went off great. They did it exactly like CM Punk with the uh, first dance a couple of years ago where they just have the music play. She comes out in her hometown, gets a chance to talk. Now, it wasn't as great of a promo. Uh, she hasn't been gone for as long as Punk was, but she's been off of American TV for about two years now. And, you know, her promo is pretty basic stuff, but the reaction was great. It was cool to be there for her. She popped back up at the end of the show. They presented her as a star. Now, it's all in the follow-up, though. They presented a lot of people in Night One as a star, and the follow-up wasn't exactly there. So it's all in the aftermath with, Mer- with Mercedes. But from what I've seen so far, I have been impressed, and I thought uh, they booked her and handled her exactly as they should have on Night One. Your second question. So I saw Asuka limping last week on SmackDown. Do you think that she'll be 100% before WrestleMania? Because I heard rumors that we might get Bianca Belair and Naomi to take on damage control for the women's tag team titles at WrestleMania. Uh, just know we had enough Bianca versus damage control. I think that's where they're going to. I would prefer Bianca versus Tiffany, but it's pretty clear to me that we're not getting that because they've done nothing to set that up in the past month. And if they were, they would have done that already. I think we are getting Bianca and Naomi versus damage control. Um, if Asuka is her, and she probably will miss Mania, unfortunately, as far as being in the ring, I mean, thankfully, they have another member of damage control that can fill in, that being Dakota Kai, who is now cleared. So they can do it. They could do Kyrie and... Dakota Kai filling in for Asuka for the tag team title. So I feel like that's probably what they're going to do. Um, Bianca has the history with damage control. She's lost to them a lot in the last year, so that would be her way of kind of getting her come up at some damage control. I mean, she beat them a lot in 2022, but in the past year on SmackDown, she has not gotten the better of the group at all. So she can beat them for the tag titles with Naomi. They're a fun team. Um, I know people were thinking Jade might be in that spot. That's not a bad spot for her to be in, but I would rather the spotlight be on Jade on her own as opposed to win a tag team, so... Um, yeah, that, that's what I'm thinking, that we probably will get that match. Sorry, new, but beyond that, I agree. Hopefully, Bianca's feud with damage control is done after that. At Iwagu91, uh, their first question was, as we wind down here, the Triple H was booking the main roster while Sting was with the WWE. Do you think that the icon would have been used better? Overall, yeah, but you gotta remember something. Triple H still fucking beat him at Mania 31. And if Triple H also thought it was that dumb of an idea, then he wouldn't have done it. Triple H is the head official in the company. If Triple H was that against Sting losing, then they would have had the finish changed. It's not a case of like, oh, Vince said it, then we have to do it. Triple H might be the only guy on that roster that if he didn't like the outcome, then he could have gotten it changed. But he went along with it, and he beat Sting, and it made no fucking sense. So yes, I feel like overall, would he have been bucked better if he was there longer? Yeah, but... It's not as if it would have... I don't know if it would have been drastically different, to be perfectly honest. Because the, the whole feud was with Triple H when it really shouldn't have been with Triple H. It should have been with Sting and Taker. But, you know, I enjoyed the match for what it was, but the fact that Sting lost is still stupid almost a decade later. It's been almost 10 years and it still makes zero sense to me. Triple H definitely could have rebelled against that. He hasn't said nothing about it since. It's not like he's been asked about it. Even if he was, he wouldn't answer honestly. Uh, I would, I'm sure. But... You know, I, I can't imagine that he would have been putting over Sting the same way that Sting was winning in AEW. The Sting AEW run was perfect. The way they booked that whole thing with him going undefeated as an attraction, he wrestled like almost week, not every single week, but, you know, more often than we would have been seeing him wrestle in WWE. I thought that whole thing was perfect. And they, they did it amazingly well. I just wish he had a similar run and similar success in WWE. His second question Who do you think Ilya Dragunov will drop the NXT Championship to? I think he could drop it at Stand and Deliver to uh, Tony D'Angelo. And I like Tony D'Angelo, but that's just so fucking random. And D'Angelo, right now anyway, is not NXT Championship worthy. I'd be happy for him if he won. It would be a cool moment, but it's like... Ilya Dragunov is like the guy that you put the brand on his back. Like, you you put the back of the brand on, if that makes sense. Um... And D'Angelo's just not that guy. He's probably more ready for a main roster run. I mean, Ilya is too, but 
D'Angelo's been there for so long, and he's a good worker, but he's just not main event material to me. With this gimmick, I mean, he's good in the ring and on the mic, but he's just not main event to me. He's just not. So it's cool to see a fresh face in that spot. I really don't want to see him win. If it's not Tony, then I honestly, I honestly don't really know. Uh, I think someone like a Dijak would have been cool. They're not doing that. He already beat Dijak on TV a couple of weeks ago. We're not seeing that again. I'm not really sure. I'm trying to think of the roster right now. Um, a lot of the people, there's just not a lot of exciting prospects at the moment. So, I mean, I know they teased Obafemi at one point, Obafemi and Ilya. Maybe Obafemi, but that's just too much too soon, I think. Um, even if they were to do it in a few months. Maybe Obafemi. I might would rather see that than Tony D'Angelo, though. I think Tony D'Angelo, at this point, would be better suited for the main roster. And I don't really know if I'd buy him as an NXT champion anyway, at this current point in time. But I would love to be proven wrong. The last question, also from at Iwagu91. Your thoughts on Rio? Uh, she's good. I think Rio's really talented. I honestly do not give a fuck about Rio. I never really have. I mean, early on, she was... I mean, she's still very, very talented. But, like... And it's not like the Joshi wrestling either. It's just her specifically. We just don't see enough of her. She's barely around. Uh, she's not around consistently. And the pandemic had something to do with that early on. But even after the pandemic, she barely shows up. She's gotten hurt. She has to go back to Japan or whatever. And uh, every once in a while, she's not around enough for me to really get invested in her character or storylines. She's just never really done much for me personally. I enjoy her matches for what it is. It is a little unbelievable sometimes to see her in the ring with certain people. Just compared to... Because she's really tiny. I don't know if she's put on more muscle mass in recent years. She looks a bit different than she did a few years ago when she first debuted for AEW. Uh, I'm just not a big Riho fan. I'm not. I, I much prefer, like... If we're talking, like, the Joshi style of wrestling, there's other people on that roster that I would prefer, like, a Kurashida style. And maybe just because we've seen more character development out of her, like more promos and matches and storylines. We really haven't seen a whole lot of that from Riho. She'll have the occasional storyline, but she never really talks. And even if she can't speak, well, you know, very good English, uh, can't speak English very well, they can just have her, you know, do the subtitle thing. We don't even really see that a whole lot of the time. Maybe they do and have completely missed it, but, um, yeah, I've never been a big Riho fan, although she is a great addition to that roster. Again, like I said earlier with Mercedes, very good wrestler, and uh, she's been there since day one. So, you know, I'm glad she's still around and doing stuff. She's just not my favorite women's wrestler in that roster. I just feel like there's other women on the show that I would rather see featured in a prominent spot over her at this point in time. And that's going to do it, guys, for episode 538. Hashtag Ask here today for Wednesday, March 20th, 2024. Like I said earlier, I believe the first day of spring, if I'm not mistaken, which is pretty cool. So enjoy the nice weather if you're getting it. Uh, if you want to send in a question to the show for next week, you can do so by tweeting me on the Twitter machine at WrestleRent with the hashtag AskGSM. Find me on Facebook as well, facebook.com backslash graham.gsm.matthews. Drop a comment on the post I usually put up on Tuesday nights, if not in the wall itself. And be sure to include your comment or question on the uh, comment section down below, and I'll include your question in next week's edition. Have an awesome one, guys. I'm Graham GSM Matthews, and I'll catch your ass down the road.